Hello there. Today we're going to be continuing on from our video about private nuisance and uh, that land-based tort to talk about another land-based tort, which is Rylands and Fletcher. So before we start this video, I should quickly preface it by saying that I am by no means a legal professional. This video is not legal advice. If you seek legal advice, go to a barrister or a solicitor, your best bet is not going to some random guy on the internet sitting in his chair talking about law. So Rylands and Fletcher was an 1868 case where a defendant had built a reservoir of water on top of these mine shafts which he believed were closed off thanks to independent contractors being hired to come and check whether or not the mine shafts were safe to build a reservoir on top of. Lo and behold, and it's kind of obvious that there's a legal case about it, that this was not the case. Um, and the water escaped through these mine shafts into the claimant's lands, causing inevitably causing damage. So the issue in this case was that because the defendant hired independent contractors to do this survey on the land, whether or not they should be held liable. The court still held that the defendant was liable because, and I'm quoting here, the person for his own purposes, the person for whom his own purposes brings onto his lands and keeps there anything likely to do mischief, if it escapes, where this is a non-natural use of land, must keep it at his peril. So even if you hire independent contractors to uh, establish whether or not it's safe to store nuclear waste in your farm, and they find that it's safe, if that causes damage to someone else's property, it's not the contractors who are liable, it's you. So let's look at the requirements for Rylands and Fletcher action. There must be a dangerous thing likely to do dam damage if it escapes. It must be accumulated by the defendant. There must be an escape. And this accumulation must be a result of a non-natural use of land. So let's look at how that relates to private nuisance and negligence. Nuisance looks at whether the interference is unreasonable and the effect on the plaintiff is the key issue. Negligence looks at whether or not the defendant, the defendant's conduct breached a duty of care, and in negligence it's the defendant's fault that is the key issue. Whereas in Rylands and Fletcher, the likelihood of damage, if there is an escape, is the key issue. So that's the level of risk. So to start off with, we have to have a uh, dangerous thing likely to do damage if it escapes. Now. There are obvious things which are likely to do damage if they escape. Uh, explosives, for example, as was the case in Reed and J. Lyons and Co. However, there are also less obvious things. Uh, in Hale and Hale and Jenningsboro, there was it was held that a seat from a fairground ride is equally a dangerous thing, likely to do damage if it escapes. Now, this seems like a rather odd comparison to make that for the courts because you're holding that something which is employed regularly in construction and in war uh, and in demolition because it is likely to do damage to the same standard as a seat from a fairground ride which comes loose and inadvertently knocks over someone's tree. So it's important to note that because more recently there's been a move towards a less punitive, a less strict approach uh, in Standard and Gore, for example, it was found that tyres aren't dangerous. This all seems rather counterintuitive. I'd recommend you check your notes if you want a better explanation of this. Um, but yeah, just remember that it, there's been a move away from that rather punitive approach. Secondly, there must be an accumulation by the defendant. It must be shown that the defendant, for his own purposes, brings onto his land and collects and keeps there the thing likely to do mischief. This accumulation must be voluntary and it must be deliberate. So if it's an accidental accumulation of rainwater, for example, um, then that would not be the same as building a reservoir, um, as was the case in Rylands and Fletcher. Thirdly, there must be an escape. It is not necessary to show that this escape is foreseeable. However, it is necessary to show that the damage caused by the escape is reasonably foreseeable. So you can have a, a very well constructed dam holding in a reservoir of water, um, so it would be unforeseeable that that water would escape. But if for whatever reason it does escape, because remember that the person who keeps the, the dangerous thing on his land does it at his own peril, um, if it is foreseeable that when it escapes it will flood the neighbor's land causing uh, irreparable damage, then 
that would be sufficient. Finally, it must be an unnatural use of land. So consider here, for example, the difference between having a bull in a field on a farm uh, as opposed to having a bull in your garden. Uh, so that pretty much sums up the prerequisites for a claim in Rylands and Fletcher. But when can a claim be brought? It generally, just like nuisance, requires an interest in land. Um, so if you're I'm supposing that the same rules apply and the same exceptions and ex exceptional circumstances apply and the same Article 8 risks apply. If you're interested in that, go check out the previous video on private nuisance and go check your notes because it's an interesting area as to where um, what con constitutes propriety interest and whether or not that sort of undermines the, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. So we've talked about when a claim might be brought in Rylands and Fletcher, but what are the potential defences to Rylands and Fletcher action? There might be a case where the escape was owing to the plaintiff's default. Think, for example, if they did something on their land which caused damage to the banks of a reservoir on your land and water escaped, causing damage to their property. Uh, think about this as merely another formulation of contributory negligence uh, where their contribution to the, to the harm caused will have a bearing on the amount of damages uh, awarded. There might be the case of an act of a stranger. So say a stranger comes onto your land and starts digging holes in your, in the banks of your reservoir and water starts pouring out. If, that, if it is shown that this act of a stranger is unforeseeable and out of your control, uh, out of your reasonable control even, then it might then, uh, that might be a valid defence to Rylands and Fletcher. Uh, there's consent, where the neighbour consents to the um, the action in Rylands and Fletcher will fail if the claim expressly or impliedly consented to the accumulation on your land. So if your neighbour has no problem with you building a reservoir on your land, then you're pretty much good to go. And finally, statutory authority. So think here, uh, it's the same really <coughs> as in private nuisance, uh, where if you are granted statutory authority to build your reservoir, then you are defended from every claim in Rylands and Fletcher. So once again, remember that this is a strict li liability tort, so intent is not required. So just that you didn't intend to cause damage to the neighbor's property, it does not mean that you are def completely protected from Rylands and Fletcher. So to summarize, Rylands and Fletcher is when the defendant voluntarily and deliberately accumulates something, a dangerous thing, likely to do damage if it escapes on their land. This then causes an escape, which damages their neighbour's land, and this accumulation must be a result of a non-natural use of land. The, the claimant must have a propriety interest in the property to sue, and the defendant might mount a valid defence in that the Escape was due to the contributory, contributory negligence of the plaintiff. The, there was an act of a stranger which was unforeseeable, over which they had no reasonable control, and the plaintiff consented, to, whether or not the plaintiff consented to the accumulation, and finally, whether or not they had statutory authority. All four of these might be valid defences to Rylands and Fletcher, but remember that it is a strict liability tort, so just that you didn't intend to cause damage is not a sufficient defence.